Welcome to the review of Heroes of the Lance. It was created by SSI and released in 1988. It is an advanced Dungeons and Dragons role-playing game. It's considered part of the Silver Box series instead of the typical Gold Box series. It is based on the Dragon Lance campaign module for AD&D. You role-play as eight heroes trying to kill the ancient dragon Kisanth. And once you retrieve the discs of Meshekel, which is the ancient relic, you win the game. So let's take a look at some of the adventures we play as. Gold Moon is our cleric, one of the most important in the game. We have Sturm Brightblade, who is a knight, basically a fighter. Karamond Major, he's a very strong fighter. Raceland Major, which is the brother of Karaman, he's a magic user in the party. Tanthalos, who's a half-elven fighter. We have Tasselhoff Burfoot, who is a kender, and basically the rogue or thief in the party. We have Riverwind, who's a very strong and skilled ranger. And we have Flint Fireforge. He's a hill dwarf fighter. The location is Zach Saroth. So I tried playing this game in DOSBox and it wouldn't even run. So then I loaded up VMware and also Oracle's VirtualBox and tried executing from DOS inside there. And I ran into problems. So in one VGA mode, none of the fonts would display, so the text was blank, making the game unplayable. The other VGA mode, at the bottom of the screen, it did not show the character portraits and health. So finally, I was able to play in CGA mode, but the graphics are terrible with those colors, since you only have four colors. So what I decided to do was set up an old DOS PC, a legitimate one, and record with an HD camera I have. So I apologize for the angle in which this was shot, but it was the best I could do at the time. Eventually I want to get some recording software where I can capture directly from a legitimate DOS machine. Anyway, again, you start the game as these eight heroes. Only one hero can be active or selected at a time, and then they're the ones to appear on screen. The other party members are basically following them even though you don't see them on the screen. This is an action slash role playing game, so it's kind of an interesting design. If one of your first four characters is the cleric, Gold Moon, you can use the clerical staff spells. Even if she dies, there's a few of the characters that can pick up her staff and use the clerical spells. The same is true for the magic user spells. Raceland must be up front in one of the first four party members. You move from screen to screen by going up and down. Although the screen scrolls from left to right, you will notice at the left side we have south, west, north, and east. So it tells you what direction you're going through when you go through doors. Although the controls are awkward, you can attack low and high and toward the center of the body. And if you see a short creature coming toward you, you could always do a hero switch and switch to someone shorter and it makes it easier to attack them. Sometimes you'll get into weird situations where if you don't use the short character, you can't hit the enemy even though they're right next to you. Sometimes the short is a disadvantage, though, when the enemy has a longer reach on you. 
that's when you want to switch to a hero that does have a longer melee reach. You can also have ranged weapons such as throwing this axe or you can use a spear and throw it. You only have one spear or one axe though and it can only be used by the character that started with it which is kind of frustrating. As you can see it doesn't show up as an item to use so we have to give it back to the original user. And the manual says some lame excuse like they don't want to use a weapon that they're not skilled with. Riverwind and Tantalus actually have bows and they start with 20 arrows that they can shoot. The arrows are actually very useful, very good. You can fire them rapid fire such as this. The disadvantaged arrows is you don't get to pick them up like you can the throwing weapons. You can find quivers throughout the game though. And of course, like melee weapons, you can shoot upwards or you can shoot downwards. You have to be in a good position to do so though. Again, if Raceland's one of the first four characters, you can have him cast magic user spells such as Magic Missile which everyone that knows anything about Advanced Dungeons and Dragons knows Magic Missile cannot miss the enemy. In this game, not so much. It can miss. I've noticed other inconsistencies with this game. I'm not really sure if it was intentional or by mistake. This game does have an unfinished feel to it. It's quite buggy, which I'll point out later. You also have the typical sleep spell which works on most enemies and you can attack them while they're asleep and kill them quite easily. Charm basically has the same effect. Just walk up to enemies and hack them apart. And finally there's web. Same thing, just paralyzes the enemy. You only have so many charges in both the magic user staff and the cleric staff and certain spells use more than others. Tasselhoff can use pouches and then fling bullets at enemies and cause some damage from a ranged attack. There are traps that fall from above and if you're running they won't hit you. If Tasselhoff is leading he can actually detect traps and disarm them automatically. Sometimes you'll get hit by arrows that just seem to come out of nowhere and those are considered traps as well. And if you're running away from the arrow and you see it coming toward you, you could quickly switch to one of the shorter characters and it may go right above your head. There's also some pits you'll run across that you have to try to jump over and you can end up falling in them. Some of them are too wide to jump with most of the characters. The game does have the ability to be saved and restored, but only one can be done. Raceland has the ability to hover across these pits, so you want to use him when you run across some of these longer pits. And there's also some areas where you'll run into this fire that shoots up through the ground and arrows shot at you at the same time. Now one of the interesting things about this game is although the first character is the only one that shows on the screen, any of the first four can take damage when the first character gets hit. The four in the back of the party will not take damage. You'll run across different items you can pick up during the game, one being a scroll. Scrolls can only be used by Raceland, so you have to use the give command to give them to him if he wasn't the active character. You'll find quivers which can be used by the bow users. And here's a funny shot. Kender shooting this guy in the balls. A lot of the ranged attacks can actually be quite funny such as this creature across this pit just stand there swinging its sword so you can just whirl these bullets at him from a range every time the enemy gets hit they back up the game can actually be quite hard some of the monsters are pretty skilled and can do quite a bit of damage to you and sometimes you get attacked by both sides you can't pass an enemy you'll take damage trying to do so 
So this is where magic spells are very useful, such as web and charm and sleep. This type of monster, you actually take damage when you kill them. They explode. And if there's two monsters on the screen, the monster behind them, if they're a magic user, can damage the other creature. Some lame things in the game is there's a wraith, which the web spell can work on. And then the, here's a hatchling creature, which is one of the tougher monsters in the game. Magic spells don't really seem to affect them, so you have to just attack them with weapons. When one of your characters dies, you can actually pick up all their items that dropped. As I mentioned before, only the first four can cast either the clerical or magic user spells. So what do you do when you take damage? Well, luckily, Gold Moon's staff can cure light wounds. And it does not use up many charges to do so. So you just put her up front and use the tedious menu commands and keep casting it over and over. If you took a lot of damage, you could use the Cure Critical Wound spell and save you some time. There's also Raise Dead in the staff and you will probably die quite a few times. There's a waterfall you can find which will one time only heal all your wounds for all party members. Extremely useful. If you stumble across green potions those can also heal the member that uses them. Blue potions do as well. You'll also find yellow potions, which when used tell you you feel more confident, and red potions, which appear to slow the enemies down. You'll also find some magical rings that have similar effects, but are permanent. You'll find some random items, such as gems, which don't have a use besides to increase your score at the end of the game. Same goes for things like gold bars and you'll find swords and other weaponry but the most lame thing about this game is you can't use them again the manual says something about oh the character doesn't want to use a weapon he's not familiar with well then why put him in the game that's just kinda of silly here's some shields that are useless from the menu you can view how much experience you've earned and the types of monsters you've killed One of the awkward things about this game is trying to run and attack an enemy. You accidentally end up jumping into them. So the only way to do it is to walk up to them, stop, and then swing. Otherwise you'll jump. Also the game is just riddled with bad hit detection. Here obviously my dwarf is hitting this creature. You can see in the graphics the weapon is making contact. But no, the game doesn't consider this a hit. You'll keep swinging and swinging and nothing happens. So then finally you get closer and it starts working. The AI is horrendous too. It just has no capability whatsoever. So overall, what did I think of Heroes of the Lance? Well, it's a very fun game. And I enjoyed playing it. But I was also frustrated at the same time. So I have mixed feelings. I felt like there were a lot of design limitations as well as bugs that the game was just pushed out too early. And I know that happens on occasion, but it's a real shame. I feel like this game could have been possibly on par with some of the Gold Box series, but because of all the limitations, it just can't make that grade. Here's an example of something that's really annoying. You'll run to the end of the screen and you just get stuck. That's the only way to know if you can run to the left or the right any farther. Another thing that's kind of goofy is you can move in and out of doors and certain monsters will appear and you go back and they've disappeared or changed. Here's an example of a bug where this dwarf's just standing there trying to attack you and he's not moving. And the, again, the hit detection is horrendous and that can be quite frustrating. And even though I'm playing in BGA mode, really the number of colors is limited to EGA in my mind. So eventually you'll run across the final dragon. And boy is he hard. 
He kills pretty much any party member with just one or two attacks. You can use the protection from Dragon Breath spell, and it seems to work somewhat, but it's still not very protective. And one of the worst bugs in this game is after a few of your characters die when fighting this dragon, the game completely freezes up. Yeah, just like that. I tried several times, and the same thing kept happening. A perfect example of how this game was pushed out too early. There is a special spell called Final Strike, which the magic user can cast, and it just destroys everything, including your own party members. So I at first thought that's how you kill this dragon. But in reality it doesn't do you any good, because the game's over and you lose. So I'm not really sure the purpose of that. Now I'm going to show you how to kill the dragon. So if you don't like spoilers, please stop watching now. This is recording the VMware version running, so it's straight on now. I hope you enjoyed this review, and I'll see you next time.